also entertaining and that might come uh, against certain common beliefs because we are going to talking about regulations after all. But I'm pretty sure that we're gonna deliver this promise simply because of the composition of the great panel that we are having on the stage and I will introduce our, uh, uh, our top-notch speakers very, very soon. Before I will do that, I would like to also uh, congratulate to the Center for European Policy Studies for putting this incredible agenda, for securing absolutely the best speakers that you can have in Brussels and beyond to speak. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for doing that. I think that this event and everything that you're doing uh, confirms that you are uh, one of the leaders of policy debates uh, in uh, Brussels and across Europe. And we are happy at EXO to have SEPs as our member. So thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, but yeah, let's go to the essence and uh, I would like to start with uh, basically with the most important job that I have as the moderator and that is to introduce um, yeah, you with our spectacular speakers. Um, and I would like to start with Christiane Kirketrep de Viron, head of Unit Cybersecurity and Digital Privacy Policy at DigiConnect. Thank you so much for coming, for joining us today. Uh, I would like to introduce Florian Pennings, Cybersecurity Director at Microsoft. Thank you, Florian, for coming. Uh, Ross Anderson, Professor of Security Engineering at the University of Cambridge. And thank you, last but not least, Bart Grutius, Member of the European Parliament. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for uh, joining this session. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I guess it's kind of needless to mentioned that uh, the recent years and ma months have brought tremendous developments when it comes to regulatory and legislative field. And um, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone as we are observing uh, tectonic changes in the geopolitical landscape, huge changes when it, when it comes to the cyber threat landscape itself. And of course, um, uh, as obvious as it is, in, uh, increasing role of digital technologies in our everyday life. So basically, in my view, we could spend weeks, days, for sure hours, talking about different pieces of regulatory uh, developments. Uh, but unfortunately, we have only 16 minutes to do that. That's why what I would like to propose today is to focus on 156 pages of the key two regulatory pieces that were uh, or adopted or, pro or proposed in the recent, in the recent uh, um, uh, months. And with that, I would like to also introduce the rules of the game for today's meeting. So the, <clears throat> the way how we would like to run the panel is to start with a short, uh, uh, brief opening remarks coming from our, uh, from, from our uh, uh, speakers, and then I will go and jump straight forward to the Q&A session with you, with our, with our audience. So I very much encourage you to not only listen to the opening remarks, but also take down some questions, some remarks, some comments that you might have, and I will ask you to, 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 to join our interactive discussion just after, after uh, initial remarks coming from our speakers. I hope it works for you. I hope it's gonna be a very dynamic and interesting session, so, and with that, uh, I, would like to, I would like to start. And um, if, if possible, I would, I would like to start with, with uh, Mr. Bart Grothius. Uh, not only because obviously you are the key person that cooks the regulatory developments for us. Uh, you iron out the, <laughs> the most important uh, um, regulations that impact all of us, but you are also bringing to the stage, in my view, quite unique and super interesting combination of two characteristics. Meaning not only being a political leader, but also being a extremely skillful tech slash cybersecurity specialist. So we are very much looking forward just for your brief, uh, brief remarks just to set the scene for what is gonna be discussion. Thank you very much. It's probably too much honor for me, but uh, let me keep it uh, short for you guys to give an introduction. As rapporteur in the NIS2, the European Union thought it was a good idea to regulate entities. Now there's a new regulatory piece of legislation, the CRA, to, regu to regulate products. And then our colleagues from DG Connect say, we're done. And I firmly disagree. <laughs> firmly. And let me just touch on a couple of things. We'll talk about the CRA later and how I think about it, but let me just touch on a couple of things. The first is the basis of what we think in Europe is should be a regulatory framework is information sharing. But I agree with much of what has been said about that in the UK and the US that's probably much highly overrated because information sharing doesn't really resolve much, does it? 
it's not been that successful, is it? Information sharing is hardly any active form. It's passive forms of, of sharing information. Not much is being done with that information sharing, is it? So we're introducing huge amounts of regulatory frameworks as in for information sharing. But what you want is not information sharing. You want to do something. You want to be actionable against what is happening. You want to actually thwart, stop incidents. That's what we want. And there we have a problem. And I think that from these active forms of defense, that's what we should be focusing on. Not in regulatory frameworks, but in actual execution of our executive bodies around Europe. That's what we need. For example, DNS. We should cooperate with our internet service providers and say, we have this ecosystem, and now we have information sharing. We know these domains and these IP addresses, they are malign. But why are internet service providers not, why are they still resolving this? Is this normal? I was in the Rotterdam Harbor in 2017, 18, when not Petia came, and I was in duty in the National Cybersecurity Center, together with Florian, when uh, WannaCry occurred, and we knew in the morning, we knew the domains on with which the North Koreans and the Russians would call back, and still they were able to infect many, many, many systems across Europe. Why on earth can we not resolve this? This is not a legal issue. It's not, nothing to do with net neutrality. There's several countries in Europe already doing it. There's businesses offering it. Why can't we make this happen for uh, business for us? The same goes for the U.S. The U.S. has a huge advantage. If you look at companies like Verisign, they block a whole lot of malware on behalf of the U.S. government. Do they do the same for Europe? Not yet. It should be done. Just look at Iran, the Iranian diaspora. I'm a member of European Parliament and also first vice chair for the relations with Iran, and I worry about what's happening there. But the first stepping stone for repression, for torture, the first stepping stone for, 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 for repression is always the cyber tool. It's always getting on someone's iPhone, right? And now ESET, a wonderful and the only last bastion of endpoint secure cybersecurity protection in Europe, and it should be kept European. It's the last one, right? Um, they they have they have they've um, they've put forward this uh, disclosed this this uh, Russia Iranian operation against the diaspora in, in Europe. And what are we doing with it? Hardly anything. Are we blocking those domains? Are we instru Are we advising the Iranian diaspora, diaspora? Is our business community involved? No. So we're not having a real active posture on cyber, are we? We're not doing that much of a good job, I would say. The same goes for telemetry, that data that the, the, the cybersecurity business have. Is, is, is that combined with what the governments collect? And is that being enhanced in a proper manner yet? I don't think, I don't see real progress there like the NCSC in UK is doing every morning. And I like they are doing in Israel, for example. I've seen co combinations make, being made there, which is brilliant. Never seen anything like it in, in, in Europe. Uh, just a couple of more. Isn't, isn't ransomware also a instrument of the Kremlin to weaken our societal fabric and economic structure? I think so. Is it just merely a regulatory or technical problem? No, it's also a diplomatic problem. Let's see more of that. Um, listen, um, the, the, the lessons learned that we draw here in the think tanks in Brussels on the Ukrainian war worry me. It's being said like, ah, the big cyber Pearl Harbor, it's not there. So the lessons drawn is that the Russians aren't that bad and they have worse uh, intelligence services and the, the, the large attacks haven't, haven't occurred. Well, the operational tempo is higher than ever. And there's a prevention paradox. So if you see what the UK, the US, the EU and others and, and the, the Ukrainians but for themselves are doing to harden their cyber defense, to, to harden their vital infrastructure, it's magnificent. And you know what they do, what the real lesson learned is? XDR. Extended detection, extended response from a central location to their vital infrastructure without anyone stepping into a car to resolve a crisis, but actually doing it, that's their secret. That's what we should be drawing <coughs> as a lesson, not like nothing to see here, move along. Then a couple of other things. The intelligence community is out of any regulatory framework we have in Europe. That's a problem because attribution happens there. And second, you need, if you want to do proper cyber defense from unclassified to top secret straps and uh, what, what you have, you need that combination. And we don't make that combination, which is highly problematic for our posture. And then if you look at 
for example, the cable-bound SIGINT, which is not done properly in every country. But we do have international law that says you have due diligence obligation. If in any European country a server would attack another country, you need to spot that. You need to locate that and mitigate that threat. It's an international obligation by international law. If you don't have sensors in your companies, you need to have cable-bound signals intelligence capabilities to detect that. We don't have that. Last but not least, it's the Russians on the world stage that make giving us a hard time with the Budapest Convention. What we neglected to do was put forward our version of the cybercrime treaty that we wanted it. And we let the Russians put forward their version. Now we are in the defense, the Russians in the offense. So I'm looking at a regulatory framework here, which is being done. Like we have the CRA, we have the NIS2, but still we don't have the mindset to a company to really do what is necessary. So I think there's plenty of work for von der Leyen too, and I'm happy to contribute to any thinking that might enhance our cyber resilience and etc. in Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much. I cannot state enough how, how happy it makes me here that we are talking not only about compliance in context of the, of the regulations, but also about this threat-driven, uh, risk-driven approach and the implementation that comes from that, rather from just ticking the box to make things uh, right uh, in front of the regulators. Uh, I, I hope that we will have a chance to come back to those topics uh, in, uh, later on, but now I would like to actually kindly ask Christiana to also shed the light on the on, on, on your work, what you're doing in context of Cyber Resiliency Act, something that in my view, and I come from the financial industry, from the CISO community, there is something that, 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 that should, should have happened years ago. I mean, we can talk about the details, about how to iron it out, but in, in principle, this is something that is truly needed for the market. So if, if you could just uh, say a little bit uh, about that. Yeah, thank you very much. And also thank you, Bart, for always keeping us on our toes uh, and coming up with new ideas. Uh, we talked a little bit with Bart now uh, on, on what's, uh, what needs to be cooked for the future. Uh, I'm going to talk about what's on the stove right now. Um, so obviously we have uh, the NIST2, which is about to enter into force, and thank you very much also for that. Uh, and with that, we are putting a lot of uh, new requirements on our operators of critical infrastructure, and one of them is that we're telling them that they have to manage their supply chain risk. Now, I used to work uh, on the operational side of the commission, so ensuring that commission IT is cyber secure and it's up and running. And I can tell you that that is quite a headache to be told, secure your supply chain. Um, because basically, you do not know what you're buying. We're buying more and more products, but we cannot actually always tell what is the security of the products. And as our head of 30U likes to say, it's basically telling us to buy a car. Very likely, it's going to crash but you gotta buy it still. And that is a little bit the situation if you look at the market right now, um, because there is very little incentive um, to produce secure by design. When you look at hardware and software, it's a very much a market that's driven by speed, and rightly so, we have to come on the market quickly. But at the same time, we also see that uh, more and more so, the risks and that are associated with vulnerabilities are exploding. I think Inisa last year showed us that supply chain attacks are quadrupling, not doubling, but quadrupling every year. It is becoming much, much more prominent. So for that, obviously, we need to look at our digital products, make them more secure, and we need to address the issues of vulnerabilities. Two thirds of the incidents that are reported on the NIS are related to exploitation of vulnerabilities. For us, that means, you know, we need to look at hardware for sure, but we certainly also need to look at software. Why? Because if we look at CISA's list of the top 15 uh, uh, vulnerabilities in 21, the vast majority is software. If we really want to be secure and look at where is our weakest point, we also need, of course, to look at the software in addition to the hardware, because we also know that hardware can be weaponized. It can be made part of botnets. It can become be used for the DDoS attacks. Uh, like we also seen uh, recently, uh, like the types of attacks we also saw in the parliament. So it's very simple in a way to spell out what we're doing. So basically we're asking the developers and the manufacturers to do a risk assessment. Look at what, where is your product being used? And on that basis, uh, 
look at the requirements we are putting for the design and development process. Here's a list of cybersecurity requirements. Take them into account. Secure by default access management. You have to assure confidentiality. And very importantly, you have to design your products so that you can fix vulnerabilities through updates. I would say these are not outrageous requirements. They're high level. We put them in the regulation in a way that they're high level objective driven so that as a producer or a manufacturer or a developer, you yourself can look at what is the trade environment, what is the risks associated with my product, and you can find the right level of technology for it. Then, of course, uh, you need to go through conformity assessment, and I think that's something that we definitely uh, are discussing now and we need to discuss much more. It means that f the vast majority of products, we put them through self-assessment, that we estimate it's around 90%, but even if it's self-assessment, let's be clear, it's not a simple process, but I think there is a very, very strong drive to make this as simple as possible. We are also looking at how can we design self-assessment in a way to give the tools and to give the guidance to companies. On our side, we are committed to say, it has to be so simple that if you're a tech entrepreneur, you should be able to understand actually what you're dealing with. I think this is crucial because as we know, we also have a lot of SMEs and startups who will be going through this. Uh, we also have, of course, a small por uh, portion of our products which we consider so critical that they have ended up on a list. Uh, these are often the ones that are used either in critical infrastructure or they used with uh, or they have cybersecurity functionalities. Um, so for those ones, it would be required either to form, uh, follow harmonized standards or to go through third-party uh, conformity assessment. And for us, it's one of the things where I also think it's an area where we need to have much more discussion and where we're also reaching out to industry because the devil really lies in the implementation. And we need to talk much more about what does this mean? How do we design it? If you're a big player, you put out a lot of products, do you really need to go through conformity assessments for every single product? And the answer is, of course, no. We do have modules there if you are doing quality, where we do quality assurance, so it's like getting a driver's license, and you will be able to put all your products on the market because we looked at how you're operating as a business. The other thing that I would say is also very new for the CRA that I want to mention is, of course, the fact that we're looking at life cycle. You cannot just put a product on the market and forget about it. We want you to do testing, we want you to do uh, patching, and we want you to push the patches out, or no, not push them, uh, in a pull way, I should say, otherwise everyone get nervous, uh, but we want you to make them available and inform about it. And this is, of course, part of your responsibility then as a manufacturer. And the last thing we're asking, and it's not only related to information sharing, but also to transparency, the last thing we say, if you discover a vulnerability under active exploitation, i.e. someone is already exploiting it, you need to report it to INISA, our cybersecurity agency. We're not asking for a technical report. I think anyone who's ever dealt with incidents will know that the first 24 hours you literally know nothing. You're trying to deal with it. Uh, but we want a flag. We want a notification to set the clock ticking so that those, and here we actually come back to NIS again, because when you're operating critical infrastructure, you need to know if there is something an active vulnerability or actively exploited vulnerability inside your system so you can take prevention. You need to mitigate the risk yourself potentially if there's no patch. So here we come back actually with the link between the CRA because we're mandating the manufacturers to deliver the patches, but we're also asking flag in case you're not capable so our critical infrastructure can protect themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, at least two takeaways that I that I take from this from from this great speech. First, uh, apparently complexity is the greatest enemy of security and business potentially. And the second element is, of course, that we need to have this vibrant dialogue with the private sector while, as I said, ironing out the, the details. And speaking about that, uh, Florian, I think that this is a perfect segue to your intervention because, I mean, again, needless to say that both NIS2 and CRA will bring tremendous ch changes to the functioning of the private sector. I can tell you from the experience at uh, EXO that, that the, uh, both uh, those acts triggered uh, incredibly vibrant discussion between our members. We are just right now preparing the position paper on CRA, so please uh, heads up to that. Um, but what is your 
what is your view on all of that coming from the from the from the digital champion, digital giant, and the representative of the private sector? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. And, and actually, it's nicely teed up by Bart by creating the sense of urgency, go, going wide, eh, and on, on the role of CTI, uh, cyber threat intelligence, and, and cyber security in general. And then Christiana takes it to the legislative uh, side. So for Microsoft, both these things are super important. Um, and, and, and thanks for, for having me on the panel to explain that a little bit. There, there are two elements that I would like to address very shortly here, also in the sake of time. So on the one side, you've got, as Bart mentions, this sense of urgency. What do private entities, what do, do essential entities or critical entities, how you'd like to call them, companies, what do they do? And let me just give you a brief look into what we as Microsoft do and what we have to deal with, super short. We, we collect 43 trillion signals, security signals a day. Imagine, that's, in, that's insane. So if there are discussions around data, of course, I can understand that that leads to certain, certain observations, but we need that because we need to make sure that our 30 operational teams are able to act on these things. As Bart said, it has to be actionable. We have to be able to do things with it. We can't just look at it and say, okay, yeah, there are so many legislative uh, frameworks and, and prohibitions that we can't share that anymore. So that's where I, I would like to say that we have 8,500 experts around the clock looking at this stuff. Two, three years ago, when I think we had a first conversation, Bart, uh, around this when we both were in our new roles, it was 3,500. Now it's 8,500. That grows. That just shows the magnitude. It also shows that this is a global problem. Cybersecurity is global. Solutions need to be global too. And that's where I would like to make the transition to, uh, to uh, legislation. The um, reason why we are so actively involved in the EU is because we do believe in harmonization of cybersecurity legislation. And that's great. Brussels, in that sense, is super, super helpful for us to make sure that when we implement something, we can do it 27 times. So big kudos to that. But then if you look at the two... The two files, that is also what you've asked me before, like NS2 and the CRA. The NS2 is out of its uh, negotiation phase. Now it goes to implementation phase. That means that our colleagues and our customers as well, we need to look at these things. Like, how do we implement this? How do we make sure that whatever we do with the right source resources really gets picked up in the right way? That means that um, we have to think about our security risk management approaches. We have to think about how do we get information on the reporting requirements to the right people. How do we avoid, if I report it to um, one CSERT or SOC, as, as was mentioned before, that I feel comfortable with giving that information and those people behind that wall are able to fix things behind the wall, behind the public wall I'm talking about, and are also giving that back to us. That's where we really have a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges still ahead because we need to see how this plays out and we'll be definitely active partners on the implementing acts and the delegated acts and everything behind uh, the NS2. Um, but one thing as well, and there I really uh, support what, what Bart said, and I know you, you, you agree with that as well, Christiane, is that, that that cooperation needs to go beyond what legislation requires us to do. And it doesn't mean it has to be really fine-tuned, but it does mean that if you look at the current CSER cooperation uh, network, there is no, no public-private mechanism in there. If you look at the NS cooperation group, there is no public-private mechanism in there. And if you'd like to do that, then consider about two, uh, two main considerations there would be uh, make it as transparent as possible. And of course, not everything needs to be on the table, especially in the current geopolitical instability. And also make sure it's inclusive. Because you need to have the right players at, at, at the table. And it doesn't mean necessarily it always has to be Microsoft, but you need to look at the topic and say, hey, where are the first responders? Because we are often first responders. We see a lot and we see it quickly. Now, let me then move quickly over to the uh, Cyber Resilience Act. That's really in the negotiation phase, so good times ahead. Um, four uh, four main, main, uh, main things that we see there. The, the objective of the Cyber Resilience Act, looking at products, that, that's an objective we, we can only agree with. We need to secure more, we need to be able to secure more, but it needs to be clear. So if we look at the text, there are some, some ambiguous definitions in there. And um, if you, for example, look at scope, um, a little text that, that I'm sure we're going to have a great fun discussing this will be um, <laughs> the inclusion or exclusion of uh, software as, as a service and then where it, where it connects to remote data processing. That creates a lot of questions, not only with us, but also with our customers. So we need to dive into that. Um, if you then look at scope, just to take it a bit to a higher generic level, what we've suggested early on, and, and, and we're sticking to this, is do this in a phased approach. 
have a smaller scope, learn from this, create evidence, and then move to your next phase, and move to your next phase. So it's a bit like the NAS, NAS1, NAS2, maybe NAS3. Because only by creating a bit of evidence and having an open discussion about it and creating also very clear lessons learned, you'll be able to move gradually towards uh, and, and through, the, through the file and the requirements. Then there's a big question that we're having simply because we're a larger company and we're involved in many of these compliance discussions, and that's resources. And, um, and we briefly spoke a little bit about the, the EU-US uh, cyber dialogue being on, on the agenda and the TTC and a lot of questions about the role of, 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 of standardization, but also how do you make sure that the company and the products and services that are in scope and then they fall under the Cyber Resilience Act are able to, to get those uh, conformity assessments, CAPs, conformity assessment bodies. There are not a lot of experts in the EU. How are we able to cope with that? Certification, Cybersecurity Act certification, which in essence we really, we really are supportive of in the sense that uh, one certification I get in, in Hungary or in the Czech Republic or wherever, it tests in all the other 26 member states, that's excellent. But if we look at the current volume of production by INISA, a great cybersecurity agency, I had a pleasure to work there a couple of years, they aren't able to keep up. How do we deal with those questions before we start entering all these uh, legislative discussions? Um, and I think I'll leave it at there and then uh, hand back over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florian. I mean, uh, absolutely, implementation and the resource-related uh, issues, this is something that needs to be discussed and hopefully maybe on that panel. But before we will go into that, I would like to, I would like to ask um, our, our last but not least uh, speaker, uh, Professor Anderson, for your input coming from the academic point of view. I'm personally a firm believer in the multi-stakeholder approach when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. I mean, um, I believe that academia and all different kinds of stakeholders should be engaged in the dialogue from right on, from the get-go, in order to devise solid and well-working mechanisms. So I wonder if you could share with us uh, your thoughts about the current regulatory changes and uh, developments. And my uh, question is, do you need the clicker? Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll need somebody to um, advance the slides if I'm using slides that I can... Well, given that you put them up, I might as well use them. Okay, good. Um, so I prepared a few slides um, on the train over yesterday and this morning, uh, wondering where security and cryptography policy go in the next decade. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the UK is now a bit of an outsider, so we can stand to the side and we can see how the three worlds of, you know, a, a, a America, Europe, and China are going on. Um, so let me just see. Let's... Okay, so um, what are Europe's strengths? Well, the, a great strength is the rule of law um, and the fact that with the largest market, Europe can lead on regulation uh, because in many of these issues that concern us, Washington doesn't care and nobody else is big enough to matter. So this enables us to do things around privacy with GDPR. Sectoral safety regulation is something that I've had an interest in from time to time. The various medical device directives, what goes on with cars, and one of the last pieces of work that I did with the Commission in 2015-16 was sustainability. Um, basically, there's a trilemma here that you can have security, you can have safety, you can have sustainability. Choose any two, right? If you catch stuff all the time, um, you can have it um, secure, uh, but, and you, you may have it safe, but it can be very expensive to patch a car every month. Similarly, if you've got a standard um, safety approach of test it to death and then never patch it, you can't have security if you connect it to the internet. So this is one of the big dilemmas that people have to deal with. What are the weaknesses? Well, most of the key tech players are elsewhere. And one of the things that we've been doing is exploring what's happening with coordinated disclosure. This tends to run through CERT rather than ENISA. Uh, we had some interesting experiences recently disclosing some vulnerabilities that affected essentially all compilers and all machine learning models. And having to um, coordinate that through CERT was an eye-opener. There's a paper on this on our webpage. But CERT, the, the US um, nexus is where you go for this kind of stuff rather than the EU because that's where the firms are. Standards tend to be driven by NIST more than Etsy. And the underlying drivers for compliance are often from US policy. One interesting example, given that we heard about telcos um, earlier on, is that there's an enormous investment at the moment in upgrading all the world's cryptography for post-quantum crypto. 
A typical phone company might have 30 or 40 different types of uses of encryption, everything from the way they talk to your SIM card uh, through the protection in their data center for the infrastructure that supports 5G. Um, this is all being updated. It's being updated through immensely complex mechanisms. It's all ultimately being driven by the NSA's concerns about not letting the Chinese see or interfere with lawful intercepts. So um, that's an example of how big mandates can arrive from outside. So what are the opportunities? Well, one of the things that we can do is to coordinate security, safety, and sustainability as ever more devices come with software. Um, some people talk about the Internet of Things. Um, a cynic would say this is actually the Internet of Trash. If you need to buy a fridge, don't buy a smart fridge because in two years' time, when Samsung turns off the server, it will turn into a frosty brick. How can you push back on the obvious commercial incentives? Well, you need some kind of government action somewhere. Where is it going to be? Well, in the EU, um, you're large enough to hold the moral and economic lines as the neoliberal consensus starts to fray. And given that you have got regulatory power, there's a reasonable chance of attracting manufacturing and services. Um, one example, I do occasional bits and pieces for Infosys. They're um, investing in, in a big center in Romania to do development. Why? Because of your footprint in Europe and Romania is a good place to do it. Multiply that a thousandfold and it begins to uh, make some economic sense. Another opportunity is to extend product liability from um, stuff to services. At the moment, that's a great area that lets a lot of things through. Another opportunity is that you can maintain broader societal red lines. The obvious example in the last two weeks being what's happening with Twitter. Who in the EU can be held to account um, when bad things happen on Twitter? We wait to hear from our colleagues in Dublin. So what are the threats? Well, the big threats are that, with, that there's a smaller research base in the USA or China, and this reflects itself in all sorts of ways. There's a smaller hardware industry than China, and there's a smaller software industry than India, and policy can end up being vulnerable to external agendas. Um, one issue of concern at the moment to NGOs in Europe is the child sex abuse regulation, which is basically something being driven by the NSA who wants a means of doing bulk wiretapping of WhatsApp because that's what all the diplomats use. And whenever um, Britain has to elect a new prime minister, which we seem to do about every month these days, um, it's WhatsApp that the conservative MPs use as they get together in little cabals and they plot and scheme. And if you're a signals intelligence agency, you really want to get your hands on WhatsApp. And as we know from the PEGA committee, um, you can hack anybody, but you can't hack everybody because if you do, then Toronto finds out, they tell Apple, and Ivan Kerstich uh, patches the vulnerability that you were using. So you can end up with policy being captured, and it can end up harming such domestic firms as there are, and it can impose costs on new market entrants. So a holistic view of this kind of policy is necessary. So what's the way forward? Well, there's, there's good news in that the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act have set, set global standards. European courts provide a backstop for human rights. Even the UK is still um, under the jurisdiction of the Strasbourg Court, thank goodness, despite the wet dreams of our current Home Secretary. Um, we can keep um, pushing back on monopolies and protecting consumers, but what we do need is some clear thinking about the equities issue, particularly when there's a time of conflict and there are uh, conflicts on the one hand between increasing the operational pace and getting more involvement in, in cyber defense and perhaps offense. And on the other hand, there's the requirement to not just patch toys. You have to patch cars. You have to patch medical devices. This means that things like breach reporting and vulnerability disclosure need to be re-engineered more around safety regulators um, and around um, other parts of the government machine rather than just law enforcement and intelligence interests. So there we have it. Thank you so much. Uh, um, that brings me uh, to the point that, that actually what we are discussing today fits very well with a larger discussion about the uh, uh, European digital sovereignty and maybe these are also the aspects that we can explore more. But before we will do that, I would like to uh, exactly start our discussion with the audience. I can see that we already have first question coming from Goran. So um, oh, thank you so much for passing the mic. 
Thank you very much, Joanna. I could hardly wait. It was, it was such an interesting panel. Uh, hi, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Goran from uh, Okta, the identity and access management company. Um, so uh, Professor Anderson uh, just mentioned about you know, the need that we need to be patching everything. Uh, and that that's one of the actually the, the objectives of the CRA is basically to introduce frameworks that would oblige all type of manufacturers, not only critical device manufacturers, to uh, get into compliance and to uh, beef up their security. So I'll, I'll try to make everyone happy and I'll have actually a question on the operational side and a question on the compliance side. On the operational side, um, the CRA, what is actually new in terms of legislation, is that it requires of all type of software and hardware manufacturers to both report vulnerabilities and incidents to ENISA. And so here the novelty is that the reporting is not going to the national competent authority where you know, the specific manufacturer will be based, but it would be to ENISA. So two comments here on that. When it comes to patching, I think it also would make, make sense to take into account that first the patching has to be issued because otherwise we may end up in a situation where this information, if it goes in the wrong hands, gives basically kind of the model of how to attack or you know, um, uh, make a specific device or specific software vulnerable. So probably this is something that uh, you know, I, I, would, I would kind of appreciate hearing comments. And then on the other side, you know, because the reporting happens with, you know, to ENISA, would it actually make sense to align this with NIS2, right? I mean, making actually the reporting to the National Competent Authority, probably also with ENISA being informed or kept in the loop, as just to ensure that, again, we, we, we make this more efficient, right? Again, here, the, the, the question, I think Florian uh, had great comments on that, is the harmonization. And um, Chris, Christian uh, Kierkegaard de Viron also mentioned that, you know, conformity assessment is like a driving license, right? So the idea of a driving, driving license uh, is that, you know, you can drive from one country to the other and it's still valid. So, you know, again, I think that that would make sense, you know, to, um, you know, um, uh, make the um, uh, national competent authority the one who receives the first incident reporting and needs to be kept in the loop also not to overload them. And final comment, one more on the compliance side, is the conformity assessment that would be required for the critical device manufacturers, right? Um, uh, will have to be made available in any language required by the uh, market surveillance authority. Because those micro surveillance authority are national, that effectively means that any device manufacturer will have to um, make a conformity assessment in all the 23 official languages of the EU. So again, here my question is, would the one-stop shop model benefit where you know, similar to EU certification, you, you get the conformity assessment in one country, it's valid for the entire EU, and whoever, you know, national market authority requires it, you just make it available in, you know, whatever, English or, you know, I, I, I don't want to go into the polemics of what language should be used, but obviously, you know, to have a model that would be a bit more uh, effective as well. I think that actually that will benefit a lot also to some of the smaller players, the SMEs, that would not necessarily have the capacity nor the finance to get into 27 procedures. Thank you very much. And hope I wasn't too long. No, thank you so much, uh, Goran, for a very insightful question. And I guess that uh, as it was addressed to the panel uh, uh, as such, uh, I think it makes sense to start with Christiane and Mr. Grothius, if possible, uh, with, the, with the part related to the harmonization and, uh, and efficiency gains. OK, thank you. And thanks for the question. So I'll start with the simple one in terms of uh, the translation and the languages and whether it works on all the EU market. Indeed, I think that's one of the values of this proposal, as Florian also said, is the harmonization aspect. So if you're good to go in one country, you're good to go on the EU market. That's the whole idea. Now, on the reporting, um, obviously I know it's a topic that's hotly debated, especially when we talk with industry. I think it's important to make four points absolutely clear. First of all, when it comes to vulnerabilities, we're not talking about you discover a vulnerability, you have to report it. Of course not. You discover a vulnerability, you have to patch it. However, if you discover a vulnerability which is under active exploitation, that's a different ballgame, right? So there you have to then notify. We have written reporting it. I'm starting to regret it. Uh, I think we should talk about notifying because no one is asking you to provide a technical report because... Honestly, after 24 hours, who would be able to draft such a thing? I would be very surprised. So you need to notify it, you need to flag it, because we need to start looking, of course, at where are we using this specific uh, product. 
uh, and who do you flag it to? So we're proposing in NISA. Why? Because when you're looking at these products, they are often available on the entire EU market. Right? So if you would go only to your national CSERT, that's very good for whoever is working and who has products and are using the products in that national area. But many, many times, and especially, of course, with software, but certainly also for hardware, it's sold throughout the Europe, uh, the entire European Union. That's why our thinking is central entry point in NISA, and in NISA shares the information. Now, important related to this is Sharing with Inisa does not mean going public. We're not doing any public statements here. We share with Inisa, it's secure. We're going to ramp up sec uh, security of Inisa. We already see foreseen the resources for that on the NIS2. So this is the idea. You flag it to Inisa. And the last point I want to make is also, you know, I know we hear a lot, ooh, it's dangerous to uh, flag for zero days. And again, one, we're not provide asking you to provide a lot of information. And two, if I look, I mean, we have several international standards. We look for it. There's both an ISO standard, there's an Etsy standard that actually also says these things you have to inform about. Why do you need to inform about zero days, even if there's no patch? We need to do so because we have energy plans. We got transport. We have governments. They're running with these systems. They need to know if they have potentially intruders in the system, the same way that our industry, IP intense industry, research institute and so on, they need to be aware if there is a problem, even if there's no patch, they need to be able to protect their data, for instance. So all of these things are the reasons why that we have put in this requirement to report, even if it's zero days, even if there is no patch available. And it also reflects very well, I mean, we've been talking with uh, Google, for instance, on what they're doing. And uh, they have told us, uh, well, we are very nice, we give them seven days, uh, and then we go public. Uh, and on our side, you know, we're not going public, we're saying flag it to Enisa. So, thanks. Thank you so much. So, any comment from your side? Um, just a small, small one. But, well, we have to be aware that, um, that's, that some prime minister's office around the world have has said uh, we want our country X, Y, or Z to be cyber dominant. Whenever there's a zero day, we want to know about it. So the chances of those governments going after a repository with interesting data is more than 100%. So I see huge problems there for the security uh, of, our, um, of our products in Europe. Uh, especially when it comes to Inisa, who can't even, at current moments, have a secured up to secret connection with CSERT. So how are we, in Earth's name, going to give such an institution, which has no real relevant experience with handling real top secret classified data, because zero days are top secret strap on data, they have no experience with it. why are we going to hand that over to them? The chances of that being leaked is 100%. So I would say be very vigilant when you, do, when you, when you, when you make such arrangements. That's my, 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 my stance on it. And the second thing is we're talking about awareness, that we want to be aware. But that's my, my, my concern on, on, the, on the first, my, my first introduction. It's not about awareness or threat intelligence. It's about what you do against it. And that I want to see a plan for, and not uh, the awareness, but what we can do. And then really a data-driven solution that we know what we're doing, we're in control, we have it thought through. That's what I'm um, looking for as a, as, a, as a lawmaker. Thank you so uh, such a sobering uh, comment. And I know that the professor and Florian both have immediate comments. So. Well, um, given that I do stuff with the car industry, one of the things that I think about is this. Um, you've got 50,000 fatal road traffic accidents in the EU every year and 500,000 that cause injury. In the future, getting data from the vehicles to find out what happened and feeding it back to the vendors, to the tier one component suppliers who are often responsible for the thing that broke, um, and to security agencies in the event that it was um, something adversarial um, is going to be necessary. At present, you can't get data out of Tesla unless you sue them in the high court. The lawyers will fight tooth and nail. Right, so the system starts out broken. In the end, there's gonna have to be a system that takes information from perhaps traffic cops, uh, roadside forensics, vehicle investigators, and so on, and sends it as appropriate to security agencies, to component makers, to everybody else, so that the whole system can learn, and at the same time, you can have um, warning if any person in Moscow or Peking starts trying to brick all the cars in Europe's roads. 
what's that system going to look like? Who is even starting to think about what the design might be, about what the, um, the safety requirements will be, about the privacy requirements, uh, about the economics of security, about how it's all going to be paid for? That's future work, completely in the future. Nobody started yet. I guess that this is a good uh, recommendation for all of us, not only in Brussels, but elsewhere, to start uh, um, devising some, some, some methods for that. Florian, please, if you can also. Yeah, I, I want to come back to the, because this is, uh, now actually it gets interesting with 10 minutes on the clock about zero days. This is, this is really where w we would say, and, 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 and Bart explained it quite well, that's not the way that the industry does it. That's not the way that member states and industry have done it. Um, there are even standards, like I think ISO 29147 2018 is, is, is connected to this, where we refer to. What, ask yourself, what would ENISA, with the limited staff they have, and it's great staff, but it's limited, be able to do with the zero day information if it's not patched and you can't go public? Then they would go to an energy provider and say, hey, you've got an issue there. What would they be able to stop all systems? So if you, you get into that conversation, and, and I had the pleasure to work at the National Cyber Security Center in the Netherlands where we, we made that first guide about how do you do, you need to get public, private, and the researcher or somebody that has notified this or is aware of it, or even on the company side, to get that conversation started ASAP, you can put a deadline on there. That's, that's so, you will see from our side definitely some comments on that in the, in the, in the position on the CRA. On the other side, I do like that if you, and, and Goran pointed it out, and I want to say something about this, because that's a, that I do see that the European Commission, uh, and with support of, of Parliament there, is moving towards how do we create frameworks that are in place before we have to hit legislation in there. And that's good. I really like that. Because if you then think about getting groups together, experts together at different levels, from your te technical to your, um, to your operation level, share information so that even you don't, it's a last resort in instant. I remember discussions with Lorraine on the NIS2 in the past where she said it's a last resort. It's really, actually, we would prefer if everything gets shared before that we don't have to go and to, uh, to the artic Article 20, I think it's in the, in the NIS2. And that's, I think, an area, and that maybe plays into what Bart tries to explain as well, is there's so much more ground to cover, Isaacs, uh, a different kind of, of frameworks to explore how do you share information, create an analysis, make it more actionable, get public-private together structurally. I cannot emphasize this enough, structurally. Get people to know each other, get them in the same room, make them feel comfortable with each other, with the cybersecurity environment, throw them out for a couple of beers, it helps, it really does. Um, and then the last thing about the CRA itself, the, the NS2 and the CRA, NS2 is connected to the CSIRTs in the, in the National Cybersecurity Centers. CRA also looks towards the market surveillance authorities, right? That's a different set of people with different skills than you have no naturally within the CSIRTs. So how do we are able to get those people together that they and, and let them speak the same language, the taxonomy is the same, the operations are the same, that it can really become beneficial and not become a situation where Marcus is a surveillance authority from country X, doesn't talk to the CSER from country Y, and entities get questions from all over, because that would take resources away. Maybe I can just uh, make one comment, because you're asking, what is ENISA going to do with this information? Now, I think it's really important to underline that ENISA are not incident responsors. ENISA are not there. They do not have operational capacity, and we're not proposing for them to have it. What we're saying is ENISA gets the information, and their role is to share it with the national cybersecurity agencies that have this capacity. That is the point. It's not for ENISA to sit and go, mm, there might be something over in energy. No. We need to get this information to the national contact points because they need to know and they will also know we see more and more uh, incidents for a component of software where it affects defense industry we've seen uh, the Belgian Ministry of Defense was affected again this was a zero day they knew about it they took action right uh, so we see more and more that there are actually things you can do you can take action I know it myself from when we've had incidents with zero days in the Commission you can take mitigating actions you can engineer solutions you can kick out the bad guys you can do this, they'll come right back in again for the, because it's a zero day, but you can do things to protect yourself against a zero day as an operator. 
And this is also what we need to ensure. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'm al almost tempted to ask if we have uh, an ENISA representative in the audience because I think that this is a part of conversation that would add a little bit of color to, our co to what we are seeing. But I see the question uh, out there. Am I correct? Yes, thank you very much. Margaret Rutzke from the Confederation of um, German Small Businesses. Very interesting panel. Um, my question would be, what is the role for the small players in all of this, of small companies? And I'm talking specifically about installing companies. We have electroni uh, electronic engineering companies in our membership. We have um, car repair workshops. And they're asking with all of the legislation that is coming up right now with the Artificial Intelligence Act, with the Data Act, um, how all this regulation plays together and what will be their role to play and because they, of course, they don't even have, a four, how many was it, 5,200 experts, they have no experts in cybersecurity, and they're very worried about liability, um, and uh, I would be interested to hear what is your point of view on that, especially to the Commission and the Parliament. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Anyone uh, at the panel who would like to take this one? No? Well, you're coming. Uh. <laughs> No, I mean, obviously, there is a lot of action in the digital field under this commission. Uh, this can certainly not be uh, underestimated. I think one of the, I mean, now, of course, I don't deal with all these files, so I do the cybersecurity part. I think for us, the devil is in the implementation. This is the part that we can simply not afford to get wrong because everything will come down if we do it. So that means several, you know, on our side, of course, we're doing the negotiation, we're talking to the parliament, we're talking to the council, but as importantly for us, we want to talk to the SMEs, we want to understand several things. We want to understand, for instance, experience with self-assessment. What are the needs you have in terms of ensuring that the conformity assessment becomes as simple and intuitive as possible? Do you need specific tools? Do we need to develop tools? Do we need to get Horizon Europe to your program on the field? So we want to understand how can we help as much as possible? I know there's been a discussion, should SMEs and startups be inside or outside the scope? Everyone we talked to beforehand were actually telling us, please don't leave us out. Why? Because I would also know that if you are going to buy a product, do you want to buy one that's cyber secure or do you want to buy one that was developed by an SME? I know as a consumer which way I would go. So I think there's a broad interest in having SMEs and startups under the scope, but we really need to make sure that it is done in a manner that does not kill the little guys. There's absolutely no interest in that. And the other thing which is extremely important is on the standards. I think, and this is another big area of work that we're starting with already now because we need to be sure that we have harmonized standards in place. We also need to make sure that we are not reinventing the wheel because, again, there is actually a lot of sim simplicity in repetition. Yeah, so the idea is now we're doing a whole landscape study. We're looking at all the standards available to be sure what's already there, what does industry know, what can we reuse. And we're not just looking in Europe. We're also talking to our friends in the US. Uh, it's on the topic of the EU-US cyber dialogue. We're going to be discussing standardization. We've been very inspired by what the US is doing, for instance, on the executive order on critical software. We're very inspired by that. You can see the fingerprint on the CRA for that. And that also means that we need to look at that because, again, you may be a small company, but you may operate on a global market. Can you? Is it reasonable for us to ask you to comply with a lot of different standards? Probably not. So for us, there's also a strong commitment to ensure that we do not duplicate or we do not overlap, and it's almost the same but not quite. So this is very much about being as business friendly as possible because our aim and objective is cybersecurity, but it's certainly not to undermine our businesses. Thank you so much. Small auto promotion, promotion from uh, my side as well. At so we are doing a lot to do to help out in exactly this endeavor. I mean, we are organizing awareness sessions for our members, SMEs, uh, trying to listen their concerns, also introduce them in our position paper towards the commission and the decision makers. Plus, we also advocate strongly to have more effective process of uh, conformity assessment, certification, reusability of the evidence, so on and so forth. So I do encourage you also to get in touch with us. But, sir, I... Uh, I s Small, yeah, okay. So um, uh, with that, I saw that we have very last question and two minutes to go. So uh, 
uh, I would like to sir, encourage you to maybe um, finish the Q&A session with your very last question. Yes, thanks a lot, and thank you to the panelists for the, um, uh, for the contributions. Matteo Fellone from uh, FTI Consulting. Uh, we spoke about uh, CRA and NIS2 very much, uh, but since this is sort of the regulatory environment panel, there's one thing that I, th I think we didn't discuss as much, which is uh, the cybersecurity certifications, and especially, uh, that they were just briefly mentioned, and especially the one for uh, uh, cloud and uh, for ICT. And indeed, since we don't have someone from ENISA here, I just want to maybe try to uh, ask a question for a uh, for the commission and just uh, basically Ms. Um, Kirkitab Deviron, if you could give us just a quick hint on what the commission is doing, working with Anisa to sort of advance these, uh, these two cybersecurity uh, certification schemes, especially for UCS, because we we saw we would uh, see more of sort of final version of the implementing act at the end of the um, of the uh, of the year, and we we know that there were countries like Germany and others who wrote to the director general of the Connect to sort of start um, a discussion on this before the implementing act is presented to comitology. Um, and also for UCC because uh, the industry is very much sort of um, uh, worried that there are provisions that uh, through um, NIS2, uh, the certification scheme would be make uh, mandatory and therefore it would be uh, it would be useful to get some 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 uh, some more uh, insight from the commission as well. Thank you so much. We don't have too much time for the answer, but maybe just very quickly. Be super brief then. So on common criteria, it is coming through the pipeline. And I can also tell you that, of course, we looked at it and made sure that it is aligned with CRA and that indeed it can be used also as a presumption of conformity. That is the whole idea that's in the CRA. But on EUCC, it's in the pipeline. On the EUCS, uh, that is still within NISA. It hasn't been transferred uh, to the commission yet, so I don't have much to say about it other than, uh, indeed, uh, this is a topic for ENISA. Thanks. May I say something about it? Because if this cloud certification scheme, which is a CSA, a 2017 Cybersecurity Act certification scheme, if that were to be an NIS2 certification scheme, you wouldn't have asked this question because you would have known where it was. It would have been transparent. You would have been consulted. There would have been an impact assessment. There wouldn't have been a trade war invoked. And there wouldn't have been this brutalness of excluding American businesses from the European market. And I think it's a faux pas. A faux pas from the Commission to do it this way. This is not the way, in the spirit of the legislators and the trilogues and the vote in Parliament and the how we want certificates to be rolled out in Europe. This is not in the spirit of the newest legislation. It is in the spirit of the 2017 legislation, I agree. But this is the problem, of, this is another problem of Brussels. I once asked a director general, and I won't name him, so I said, why do we come up with a critical entity directive, with CSA, with CRA, with NIS2, and what you have? And he says, but, 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 and I said, why not one legislation, right? Logic. And he said, but, 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 but. Those are all different director generals. We need to have different pieces of legislation. Well, this is the logic of Brussels, but it's not the logic for a citizen or the logic for businesses. We need one proper consolidated piece of legislation. I think a new commission should work towards that. Consolidation of all the efforts that we have, make something and get rid of all the, and make sure that we have the newest, brightest insights from our time and day and age. Ooh, just when I thought that the discussion cannot get anything hotter. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, the time is over. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. It was an excellent time. Thank you for joining us.